Well, hello, my friends. It's me, your favorite space uncle. Hopefully your only space uncle. If not, you better tell me who the other one is. Because I might have a problem with that. I'm kidding. But, hi, how's it going? I'm in a mood. This is going to be an interesting story. I read some of it, but I apparently have managed to swallow an entire mattress and talk really, really badly. So I decided to start over. Also, I now know somewhat of the gist of this. So, um, let me give you a piece of advice that Prestigious Finger, our wonderful OP in this story, will also give you. Buckle in, and you might want to grab a glass of something strong. This is gonna be fun. So, um, here we go, kids. Ladies and gentlemen, Bridezilla, Tantrums, Swords, and Dresses. I still don't know exactly what the title is about. I didn't get that far. And it still makes me very nervous. So here we go. Dear Moon Horse and the Celestial Herd. Well, I'm one of those. Hi. Ever watchful from the moon. I do that? Please forgive me if witty opening remarks have been replaced by a spinning head from the absolute roller coaster of the last few weeks. Strap in, Moon Cult, and our fearless leader. It's going to be a ride to rival Coney Island. Oh. Oh boy. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened and shoulder restraints are in proper position. It's going to be a long one. When we last left Bridezilla, a.k.a. Megan, and her bride-to-be, a.k.a. Felicity, and the very beleaguered coordinator slash dressmaker slash bridesmaid, Angie, and the increasingly harried... Maiden of Honor. It says Maid of Honor, but I, I gave it the extra just because you are quite that fancy. And I love your way with words. The Prestigious Finger. We had left at our first official wedding planning meeting. That involved tantrums, kink negotiation, or rather a lack thereof, and near blow-ups that also nearly resulted in improvised throwing weapons. But it was all just the little psychotic hors d'oeuvres before the veritable feast of insanity that followed in the last two weeks. You know, ever since you posted that story and then you went silent, I had a feeling some serious shit was going down. I hate that I'm right. This should not have happened, and I'm very sorry. Where to begin with all this? Well, as it's a wedding, let's start with the invitations. At the first meeting, one of the first things discussed was the number of guests. The first number was around 200 guests, which seemed like a lot to me. Yeah, me too. But then I only had about 50 at my own wedding. When Angie asked, why so many, Megan said that she wanted to send some invitations out of courtesy. Angie, having coordinated several weddings, said that's what announcements are for. Say there's someone that you're pretty sure won't be able to come, like a friend or family member on the other side of the country. An announcement that pretty much tells them what's going on. Or, in Megan and Felicity's case, it was because they have the misfortune to come from highly conservative, right-wing fundamentalist families. Oh! How fun! While Megan's family is more kin to that annoying person that accosts you with a Gideon Bible while trying to walk your dog and you're far more interested in bagging your furry friend's poop than converting, Felicity's family is one crazy deacon shy of them stripping naked and running through the streets screaming prophecies. The kind of religious assholes that can compartmentalize hypocrisy and justify abuse faster than the speed of dark. Light thinks it travels the fastest, but no matter how fast light travels, it always finds that Dark has gotten there first. And props to anyone who's got that. Needless to say, these family members do not support Megan and Felicity's relationship. Megan still wanted to send invites out to them, hoping against hope that her family in particular would come to some kind of understanding and come to the wedding. Even though these family members, mother and older relatives, basically cut contact with her after she came out to them. Megan never stopped hoping that they would come around to her side, and while I understand that, I'm also a pragmatist and know that people like this are more than likely never going to come around, especially when, a few years ago, she came out as bisexual, polyamorous, and that she was going to be bringing one of her then-partners, a, a trans woman, to Thanksgiving, all in one message. You didn't just come out of the closet, you blew the motherfucker up, didn't you? 
Wow. I mean, kudos, but wow. Even if Megan's parents weren't right-wing conservative, that does seem like it would still be a lot to digest all at once. And, after her family cut contact with her, she bombarded them with messages, trying against all signs to the contrary, that they would one day see things her way, till they basically sent her a cease and desist letter saying that they were not going to respond to her messages or even read them anymore. This is too often what happens when members of the LGBTQ plus community come out to their family members. Yeah. I cried with Megan over all of these developments. But as she continued to send her messages, I begged her to try and start letting go, for her own sake. You can only beat your head against a brick wall for so long before you start giving yourself brain damage, and insanity would be expecting it not to. I mean, as sad as that is, you're actually right. There's a lot in that, and thankfully my immediate family, I don't have a problem with that, but I do worry about the extended family, which is kind of why I don't tell them anything, if you know what I mean. So when it came to the matter of invitations versus announcements, both Angie and I suggested to only send announcements to these family members, but again, Megan got very defensive, saying that she felt like we were pushing her to do something she didn't want to do. That phrase would become a theme throughout all of this. I seriously pushed for just announcements more than Angie did, because I knew what kind of torment Megan would put herself through again, and A, why would she want to go through all that again and just give herself more emotional burden to cope with? At B, why would she want openly homophobic people at her wedding? C, most importantly, and I use this metaphor by the way, you know how in D&D a vampire can't enter a place without an invitation? She'd be handing out an invite to two whole clans of them that could very well make a scene on her big day and try to ruin it, and they would have a reason to be there to do it because, hey, they have an invitation, right? Yeah, eventually you have to uh, you have to have that moment where is it family because you're related or is it family because they care about you? And I'm going to be honest with you, dude. Just because you share genetics with people doesn't make them the nicest people. Sometimes you got to find your own family. I'm a big proponent of found family. And, I mean, I have you guys, so I basically did find one. Angie said if she really must, then it was because it was a formal invitation they were sending out, just to make the invitation. No extra message, no trying to persuade them to finally accept and support them because, frankly, it's never going to happen. I suspect that maybe Megan was holding out some hope that their families would just receive their invites and seeing something as joyous as weddings happening, their hearts would grow three sizes that day, and the heavens opened, the angels bowed down, and they wouldn't be homophobic, semi-cultish bigots anymore. And suddenly, he wasn't racist anymore. And while I would dearly love that for both of them, I would also dearly love a week in wine country with Chris Evans, but we don't always get what we want. Did I mention I like your way with words? Not long after this, I get a message from Megan with a screenshot of a block of text she has sent to Felicity's mother and asked my opinion on it and if I could give Felicity advice and ideas on the message she was going to send to Megan's mother. I went, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and all of his carpenter friends. What in all the fucks was going on? Megan explained that it was, in fact, quite simple. Have the two of them send invites slash messages to each other's families so they wouldn't feel like they were being pestered. For some reason, Megan thought their families would be more likely to read slash accept an invitation if it came from their partner. And more to the point, they wouldn't tell each other if the respective families responded to the invitation so they could be surprised if their families did end up coming the day of. You know, I've never met either one of these women, but I imagine that... They must be in fantastic shape because the mental gymnastics it takes to think that that shit would work is fucking incredible. I literally stared at the text for three minutes because I wasn't sure if I was hallucinating or not. Yeah, I feel that. And I wasn't even there. Was there any medication I had forgotten to take that day? Was there indeed something I had taken and really shouldn't have? Maybe I was, in fact, suffocating at that very moment, and the lack of oxygen to my brain had conjured this bit of what-the-fuckness, because in what parallel universe, alternate Earth, 
diagonal galaxy or nexus event timeline did that make one iota of sense fucking thank you so once i had made sure that the tva weren't coming to arrest me i asked facility her opinion on the whole sordid affair that was about to become one shining example of the phrase play stupid games win stupid prizes felicity and a triumph of rational thought everywhere said that she would just as soon say fuck off to the whole lot of them. But it was something Megan wanted to do. Felicity, this entire time, had been near non-verbal at all of the meetings and chats because she had already been married before and had the big wedding experience and wanted to give Megan that chance for the big wedding. Which is extremely sweet and caring of her, but it was also letting Megan go off the rails. So I told Megan to call me, told her that this was making me hugely uncomfortable because not only was she ignoring the good faith advice I had given her, advice that she had asked for, advice that I had given her not to be malicious or push her in certain directions, but to save her grief and repeating that rejection that she had already suffered through. Now not only was she ignoring it, she was asking me to take on that emotional baggage and manage it for her. This was not an okay thing to do. If she really must do this thing, then she had to be honest with herself what kind of mental strain she was setting herself up for and be prepared to deal with it. She got very defensive and very mad when I brought this up and mentioned doing announcements instead. I don't want to do announcements, she finally yelled. I never wanted to do announcements and if only you were pushing me to do something I didn't want to do. Go ahead and take a drink, everybody. This is going to get fucking crazy, I'm sure. I felt every fuck I had to give begin to drain away through the phone as the words reached me and not even trying to disarm her indignation with some clever negotiation trick, I deadpanned her. My voice very flat, I informed her that I was calling her to talk about why I was upset, because this is what adults do. We use our words and communicate rather than grow resentful and glare like teenage edgelords squinting through raccoon-heavy eyeliner. To my amazement, she calmed down and let me speak, and after I gave her my reasons for why this was bad news bears, she relented and even apologized for trying to put it on me. She did in fact send those messages and invitations, but a gloomy Facebook post lamenting that she couldn't get half of her family to not see her evil told me that she had gotten her answer. Moving on from that dumpster fire, a few weeks later, another cigarette got tossed into the heap. I mentioned in the last installment that I had been part of a sword fighting group previously. Well, I had gotten it into my head, because I am not immune to bad ideas, that it would be fun to do a stage fight at the reception as part of the entertainment. Megan always loved seeing me fight, and I figured it'd be fun, especially if I took an old idea of quote-unquote kidnapping the bride and having her honor defended for the entertainment of the guests. I did find a partner, Luke, who, like myself, had a combination of theatrical stunt work and martial arts training. Besides the more theatrical sword fights, I had 12 years of Okinawan-style karate training and currently am training in historical medieval battles, or HMB, basically mixed martial arts with medieval weapons and armor. That sounds really fucking cool. You should check out that, um, the guy who did the uh, Katana Beard series. I'm blanking on his name, but he has an amazing channel, and I subbed to it a while back, and him and his group are actually really fucking cool. Unfortunately, Luke had to drop out of it, as his sister was also getting married the same weekend, and it's a destination wedding, and anyone would understand it would be incredibly entitled and rude to expect him to leave his sister's wedding early, or to make him do a red-eye just to do a silly bit of entertainment, right? Yes. Right? Yes. I was about to find out just how bad an idea this was. Oh, here we go. When Luke fell through, I recommended just canceling the fight and enjoying a party, but Megan had become seriously attached to the thought of this performance. She suggested their now roommate Jay to take Luke's place. What? The only problem was I knew Jay through the old group, and while I had absolutely no problems socially with him, I knew there was no way I could do a sword fight with him. I have diagnosed PTSD from everything I went through in that whole sword group. Scumbag 2.0 aside, this group was also crawling with unhinged idiots, from psycho ex-marines with anger issues to classic neckbeards. 
Oh, I imagine. I genuinely believe that more than a few of them were trying to seriously injure or end me when we did a fight at Scumbag 2.0, just like seeing me get hurt in multiple ways. What a fucking asshole. Just what an absolute fucking asshole. As an aside, because I realize the story isn't about him, but I also sometimes feel it's necessary to comment on these things, this guy's a fucking douche. Like, why would you actually enjoy seeing someone get hurt like that, especially if you claim to care about them? Fuck that loser. Once you've felt that you were literally fighting for your life and still have lingering injuries from it, that experience does not leave you. I imagine. Holy shit. My elbow reminds me of it whenever damp weather moves in. That's a bad sign, and I'm very, very sorry that you had to go through all that shit, dude. That's fucked. I tried to gently tell her this. It wasn't a matter of Jay's character or that I didn't want to do the fight, but if I was put in such a scenario fighting someone I remember from those experiences, using the same techniques learned there, personal fighting style is comparable to personal calling card, and sense memory is a huge part of it. That could be downright dangerous for me to partner Jay. I knew my fight or flight impulse would be in full action, and flight would not be the option I was going to take. To this day, friends and coworkers know not to startle me in a joking way. The last guy at work that hid behind a corner and went boo at me got hit with one of the bricks I was carrying. Ow. Safe to say, it was an all-around bad idea. Yeah. Besides the PTSD trigger that it would be, I did not want to leave any door open that might lead to the mental state I was in for those five years. It was so bad that I would sometimes black out, lose entire days, not remembering anything from the time I got up in the morning to the time that I came back to my senses. My doctor said it was a form of disassociation caused by stress and trauma. Basically, my brain had endured the maximum amount of stress that it could and just shut down. Holy shit. The worst part is I have no idea what I did or how I acted during those episodes. In a worst case scenario, what would happen if my PTSD was triggered by this fight and I did black out? Thusly, while my mental health triggers are not Jay's or my fault, it is my responsibility to manage them and it would be grossly irresponsible for me to do this fight with Jay. Again, as an aside, this is a perfect example of how you handle yourself when you have these issues. I've seen enough of these fucking TikToks of people pretending to have DID that it's just disgusting. And I would cover more of that on this channel, but I fucking hate TikTok and I'm not getting one. And you can't make me. And I'm sick of these people pretending to have disabilities or pretending to have issues. And then being like, I just, I can't control it. That's how I can get away with all this stuff. And I'm like, no, fuck you. You're an adult. Prestigious finger here totally understands that and understands that you have to be aware of the things that can cause problems for you and how to handle them. This is the same thing I talk about when I talk about my depression. I realize that I have triggers for that, but I also realize what to avoid and how to handle myself should these things happen. That's called being responsible. People who pretend to have issues don't want to be responsible. That's what it comes down to. I have this, so I can't be doing any of these things, and I just can't. No, you have the capability to take care of yourself. You just don't want to. It's easier to pretend to be a fucking child. This is that Chris Chan, it's my autism bullshit. It's not your autism. You're just a man-child. Grow the fuck up. I know a thousand different people with autism who don't act like that. Her response very nearly made me drop out of the wedding. She messaged me vouching heavily for Jay's character, something that I told her was not a factor, and that she wished I could separate the people of that group with what happened with Scumbag 2.0 because, quote, I wish you could find a way to separate the bad shit you went through with him from the rest of the group because they don't have any reflection on what you went through with him. They don't deserve to have that negative emotion attached to them. Well, no fucking shit. No, a few of them, in fact, don't deserve the association. They also don't deserve to get hurt because of a trigger that is not something that you just find uncomfortable. It's something that makes you relive a horrible experience, and for someone that goes on constantly about her anxiety triggers, trying to guilt me into ignoring mine that could result in someone getting injured was beyond entitlement. Fucking thank you. Yes. That is fucking bullshit, dude. You don't get to force someone else to go through shit just because, oh, it's my special day. Fuck your special day. Fuck you. There's a limit to the shit you'll put up with. There is a limit. And this isn't just asking 
OP to go through some shit. This is asking OP to go through some serious shit and possibly harming a second person in the process. Fuck that. You're an adult, you should know better. Seriously. But she had a solution for it. She asked, is there anything metaphysical we could do to keep you from freaking out? Oh, fucking Christ. Meta-fucking-physical. She literally asked me if I could magic away my PTSD. And yes, they spelled it with uh, four Ks, so... Yeah. Seriously. Metaphysical? Are you fucking high? Sit the fuck down, Karen. I don't even have a joke for that. I'm just going to assume that everyone knows why that's stupid and move on. Oh, don't worry. I'm sure I said enough. After I told her that these were not the actions of a friend and were our situations reversed, I wouldn't insist on her doing it. There was radio silence for the rest of the day, which suited me just fine. To my amazement, when Megan messaged me again, she was apologizing for her initial reaction. Later, Felicity informed me that she had set Megan down and explained how PTSD triggers work. Felicity also stated that Megan doesn't understand how PTSD triggers work, but, and if I'm wrong here, someone with better education, feel free to correct me, but it sounded like horse shit and not the glittery kind. The same kind of shit that I say when it comes to understanding and speaking to the trans experience. I can't, because I'm not trans. I don't know what that's like. I will never know what that's like, because that's not who I am. But I can have fucking empathy. If you tell me that something is seriously bothering you, I can have fucking empathy, and while I may not completely understand it, that doesn't fucking matter. I can still act like a good person and understand it. This is the same thing with the PTSD triggers. I don't understand all of your triggers, mainly because I'm not you, and I most likely never will. But that's fine, because I cannot act like a fucking douchebag and say that they should just be ignored because I don't understand them. Fuck that. Fuck you. Grow the fuck up. Seriously, dude, this is not a difficult concept. If somebody says this makes me uncomfortable, don't fucking do it! If she could understand an anxiety trigger and go on about her own, then the full explanation of why and how mine work should have been as clear as Savarsky Crystal. Yeah, it's almost like she was intentionally ignoring them, being a fucking asshole. After some discussion and apologizing from Megan, I agreed that the fight could still happen, but under my express terms. I would be the one to choose slash approve my partner, and they would come to me for practices. It's still currently on the ropes, as the local guy that I approved hasn't gotten back to me yet, and the guy I do want is from another state, and he's willing to do it. But Angie is against not wanting him to put himself out for it, which I understand, but since he's the one offering, I don't see why I shouldn't take the offer and get Bradzilla off my back. If the guy's okay with it, and it's not that big of a deal, I mean, I understand where Angie's coming from. It does feel like he's having to come a long distance, and that would be, you know, a burden. But if he really wants to do it, and he really is doing this out of the kindness of his own heart, I say it's okay. But I also understand the feeling. It's more of a, you know, don't, don't make yourself do this. And that's because Angie's being nice. Something our Bridezilla could learn a lesson from. Oh, did I say that out loud? Uh-oh. After that, it was Angie's turn for gloves off. Via our wedding planning group chat, Angie had to tell Megan that, with her combined duties of coordinator, bridesmaid, and dressmaker, she wouldn't be able to do the elaborate hair and makeup that she wanted. There was a person that had offered to help with the hair and makeup artist, but Megan at first didn't want her, as she's a friend of Will's friend and they met through him. Which I found ironic, since it was only a week or so before, that Megan was chiding me about not projecting the negative feelings you have for one person onto another, because they are connected in some way. Irony just keeps coming like a fucking freight train, doesn't it? I offered to get a hold of a friend of mine who's a hairdresser, and if she would do Megan's hair and makeup, but it wouldn't be a free service. Professionals need to be paid, obviously. Something they seem to be forgetting through all of this. Oh, lovely. For something that would be a two-plus-hour job, the $125 that my friend quoted sounded pretty reasonable. It actually does. 
but it was shot down by Megan saying she didn't want to pay for anything extra. I'm sorry, I had to take a minute to compose myself there, but I feel it's going to come out anyway. Bitch, your whole wedding is extra. All of this is extra. Do you think you need the fancy venue, the performance fights, and the expensive dress? You fucking don't. This is all extra. Weddings in general are fucking extra. You can very easily just be joined in a union by the state at a courthouse. Takes fucking ten minutes. Walk the fuck out. But no. This is all performance. Everything about a big wedding is a fucking performance. It's all extra. If you're gonna go in for a penny, go in for the fucking pound. Understand that it's all fucking extra. And realize when you draw a limit that the limit is on your own fucking extra. Unfucking believable. Things started to heat up when the picture of what she wanted her hair and makeup were shared to the chat. And Angie thought it was the first time she'd actually seen them. Megan insisted that she had shown them before and they had talked about it. For once, Megan was right. She had shown the pictures as suggestions, but it was months ago. And with everything else Angie was doing, I'm not surprised that she forgot about it. I mean, she's basically building this fucking wedding, so yeah, I'm not surprised she forgot too. We kept trying to find a solution. Hair and makeup has to be done in a specific place at the venue as per policy, so there's only one room to try and accommodate two brides. Angie was trying to explain how she had everything timed out, with all of us starting at 9am to get the show on the road. But then Felicity started to get upset, not understanding the timing, the planning, or what had changed when Angie had said that before they could do the hair and makeup. Not surprising, after several months of an uphill battle trying to get this wedding planned and having to explain for the third time that she had so much to do, Angie started to lose her cool. Yeah, again. Understandable. With doing the work of a full-time job as coordinator and dressmaker, she is also going to school full-time, a household to manage, and is disabled from going through cancer three times and a stroke a few years ago. Jesus fucking Christ. I, I know that I don't know you, Angie, and I doubt that you'll ever hear this video, but my god, you put up with more shit than I've ever heard anybody have to put up with. You deserve a fucking medal. I'd give you one, but I don't own anything that nice. Holy shit. Felicity said after, quote, that came off a little strong for my taste. My question wasn't rude. Angie, being truthful, told her that she was getting very upset and feeling attacked. She had been trying very hard to make this all work for the two of them, and it had been an uphill battle all the way. Uphill battle? This is pure Sisyphean. Holy shit, you might as well be trying to push the goddamn Titanic up the side of Everest. She was doing an enormous amount of work, and it was going unnoticed and unappreciated. It was like touching a match to the fuse to a ton of C4. I could type it all out, but this is already a huge post. In short, Angie made her feelings known, and was done being driven around like unpaid help, and would not stand for it anymore, nor should she have to. Megan and Felicity felt like it was attacking them, and it was triggering them. Round and round it went, until Angie finally told them that they could either have her as the coordinator and let her do her job, or they could come pick up the stuff that she had for the wedding at her house, and they could organize everything from there. And that is how you handle that shit. Bravo, Angie. Fucking bravo, dude. While this was going on, Megan PM'd asking if I could get Angie to calm down and asked, Do you think I attacked her? She attacked us! I need your honest opinion! Holy shit, dude. Rule one. Rule fucking one. About dealing with any kind of business like this. You don't fucking attack the person who's doing everything for you. Unless you have a very, very good reason, keep your fucking mouth shut. What's that old thing from fucking Fight Club? Don't fuck with us, we make your food? Yeah. Holy shit, dude. I knew indeed she did not want my honest opinion. I was always on Angie's side and we were getting each other through this stupid shit. But I knew it would just cause more drama if I told her to calm her tits and stop being Bridezilla. Which, in turn, would cause more problems for Angie. So I told her that everyone's nerves were frayed and we need to chill, take a breath, revisit the conversation when everyone calmed down. 
That seemed to placate Megan, but then she decided to play her own version of Mean Girls and wanted me to say something in the group chat about how Angie had attacked them and basically how they were right and she was wrong. Oh my fucking god, is she 16? Stop this. I said I wasn't going to gang up on Angie as everyone was arguing at some point, but Megan said that I needed to say something as Felicity had stomped off and, quote, she won't come back to the chat unless you're ready to be honest about it. Oh, fuck it. God. I don't know how the fuck you two did it. I'll be honest with you. I'm already... I'm not even a part of this. And I'm just like, fuck all of this. I could not. I could not put up with this shit. I PM'd Angie herself, first asking if she still wanted to deal with all this. Are we ready to wash our hands of it? Because I may have to do some bullshitting in the group chat if that was the case. Master diplomat that she is, Angie managed to get everyone to leave till the next morning. And, like a fucking miracle worker, and soon to be one hell of a therapist, the next morning she completely disarmed Megan in the chat, using the language of therapy and even got a phone call into Felicity that managed to get everyone back to the table. Felicity is actually pretty chill and reasonable, and the one that usually has the rational thoughts, making her very easy to talk to when she doesn't have Megan around micromanaging everything. Everyone made up, and we're making nice again. Megan even started to act like a human being and let Angie do her coordinating duties, and it seemed like smooth sailing from there. I was actually going to end it here, earlier this week. It seemed like it was all going to be fine, and we could get through the last weeks relatively unscathed. Oh, Murphy, will your law never stop being applied? This last bit of drama concerns the dressmaker who's making Felicity's dress. A very close friend of mine, Joanne, who I've known since I was 16 and is like a mother to me. Joanne is a professional tailor and dressmaker. She made my own wedding dress, and thusly I recommended her for making Felicity's. After the initial appointment to get her measurements and figuring out fabric and how much it would be needed, it was taking several weeks to get said fabric. Joanne gave her resources to look at. When Felicity got worried about finding the specific fabric she wanted, myself, Joanne, and Angie sent her web links for what she needed, till finally, having no contact from Felicity, Joanne asked to get a hold of her and ask her where the damn stuff was, as there is less than two months left. On our group chat, I asked Felicity if she had gotten her fabrics yet, as Joanne was starting to get antsy about time. All seemed well at first. Felicity wrote back that she ordered her fabric that same day, and it would be in within the week. I said, great, relay the info to Joanne, who was happy to hear that it was underway. All was well and good, but then Megan chimed in. Felicity asked Joanne for her help choosing the fabric ten days ago, but Joanne never got back to her. I knew in my bones that that was not true. Joanne has been a tailor for everything, from silly costumes to full-on historical clothing, professional reenactors for over 17 years. And in all that time she's done it, with more integrity than you would find in someone swearing an oath to the Queen of England as they receive knighthood. Wanting to do due diligence, I asked about what Megan had said, and because Joanne doesn't put up with any kind of bullshit, she told me flat out that it was a lie and she was no longer going to do Felicity's dress because she would not work with people that start drama. What's that old adage we have on the old Moon Horse channel? Fuck around and find out? Shouldn't have fucked around, bro. That, of course, set off another load of C4, but it was more quickly put out, as there was evidence to be gathered. Megan was trying to put it down to miscommunication and technical error. Their cell phone coverage is not always reliable, so the message may not have sent. If that was true, then Joanne would be willing to return to making the dress. I asked Joanne for screenshots of the last message that she had from Felicity, which was one asking about where to check for fabric online the same day as her first appointment. Again, I relayed this to the group chat and asked for similar screenshots of the message Felicity had sent 10 days, like Megan had said. Surprisingly, somehow that message was accidentally deleted. Oh, imagine that! With no proof, Joanne did indeed quit, and I cannot blame her. Nor can I. This whole situation, besides being an attack on Joanne's integrity and trust in her client, also just need not have happened. There was no argument, no issue at all until Megan decided to try and shift blame for the lateness of getting fabrics onto Joanne, which also just proved her right about needless drama being started. Though, frankly, I need to take my own responsibility on this bit. I did not need to ask Joanne about what Megan had said, and I knew that the drama was high with these two, and moreover, I was motivated by my anger over a slander against a dear friend. Did I white knight? Yes. 
Did I absolutely need to? More than likely, no. Even Angie had warned me to just leave it alone, but my emotions got the better of me, and now more work has to be made for Angie. As it is a simple gown, I've made more than a few dresses in my time as well. Angie and I will take a weekend to do a marathon session with the sewing machine. I will man the pin cushion and shears while Angie wrangles the machine and will put Buffalo Bill to shame, but here's hoping we keep a little more of our sanity, even if we end up doing the Silence of the Lambs dance more than once. Thank you to all that managed to get to the very end of this. It was a hell of a long and hell of a ride, and still not quite over yet. Honestly, I, I cannot fathom how you're still putting up with this. I... Wow, dude. Wow! I said earlier in this that you and Angie can put up with shit that I could not ever pass. I would have lost my fucking shit on these two a long time ago. But the fact that you're not only still going through with this gonna make this happen and despite whatever the fuck those two say it's gonna be goddamn magical deserves a fucking award everyone listening to this in the comment section i'm demanding i am demand i'm putting my foot down god damn it i don't usually do this shit i don't usually make specific call outs to all of you but seriously send these wonderful people some absolutely great support and messages because holy shit dude I, I don't even know what to say. There is so fucking much. We could unpack the whole box, but I kind of already did, and at this stage, let's just throw the fucker on the fire. I don't want to deal with these two and their inability to process basic understanding. And again, I stand by what I said when it comes to the whole wedding thing. I don't want to do this because this is extra. I don't want to deal with this because that's too much. Weddings are fucking extra, dude. All of it's fucking extra. You do not need a special party to prove that you're in love with somebody. That is literally what a wedding is. It's just a party. You are getting this bin out of shape over a really fancy party. Calm it the fuck down. And realize that everything they tell you, the wedding industry tells you this shit, is bullshit. They'll tell you that this is your one and only special day. Says fucking who? Renew your vows. Hell, don't even have to. Just have a party in general. You can fucking do that. It's your life. You can have more than one wedding to the exact same person if you want to. It doesn't have to have the state signing off on papers at the end of it. And honestly, that's not even the most important part to begin with. Who fucking cares about that shit? It's a very fancy party celebrating your emotions and love for one another. Stop letting bullshit get in the way of that. Simply enjoy the fact that you're going to be surrounded by people you care about, people you love, and enjoy the fucking gathering. Seriously, dude. I, I do not understand how you two have not, like, completely just set fire to this whole fucking wedding. I don't. But the fact that you're going to see this through... I don't have an award, and I'm not good at making shit like that, but you fucking deserve one. You deserve a goddamn medal for this. After this shit, I realized, you know, it's formality shit, but after this shit, they shouldn't have to throw the bouquet. They should just fucking give it to you as a fucking honor. Holy shit, my dude. Whew. That is one hell of a story, and I imagine you're going to have another one as soon as all this shit is over. And you know what? I'll buy the first round. God damn. Thank you all for being here. I really hope nobody else has to go through this kind of shit. But, if you do have your own stories, share them at r slash moonhorse stories. I, I don't even know what to say. Um, I got a Ko-Fi in a merch store. I have a podcast now, and you can gain early access to that by all the links that are in the thing. You know the thing below every video? That thing. Every weekend we stream, and somehow that seems less complicated than this. And I work with OBS, and it sucks. Like, god damn, dude. Seriously. You got my respect, like, fucking forever. Holy shit, man. 
I'll see you guys in the next video. I love you all. Goodbye.